Welcome to the Swim Swam Podcast. I'm your host, Coleman Hodges. Joining me today, newly minted Olympic gold medalist from the 2020 Tokyo Games. We're sitting down with sprint sensation, Bo Becker. Bo, how's it going, man? I'm good. Thanks for having me on the Swim Swim Podcast. Absolutely. It's, it's great to sit down and talk with you. I've talked with some of your sand, former Sandpiper teammates. Uh, recently, I talked to Ron Aitken, your, your old coach, and um, I'm excited to finally sit down and have a chat with you. Uh, I don't know if we've, we've ever talked before. I may have interviewed you once or twice, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you've interviewed me at like, you know, a few college meets and stuff, but yeah, this will be my first time on the podcast. So I'm excited. <laughs> Yeah, me too. Um, so let's, I, I want to start with Tokyo and then we can kind of move backwards from there. Heading, heading into this, had, had you ever been outside the country for swimming before? Yeah, I've been, um, I've been on outside twice now. So my okay. first, both with the ISL. Okay. So my first time was in Naples, Italy for the first season. We were there for a week. And then um, I was in the Budapest bubble. For the six okay. period uh, for ISL last season, so yeah, season. So you you would have international swim experience. Um, you had, but you've never been to a major international meet like this. Or did you have expectations going in of, of just kind of how it would feel, what it would look like? Um. Well, I mean, a lot, we have a lot of uh, guys on the team that you know this wasn't their first rodeo. They they gave a very clear picture of what it was going to be like. Um, uh, we FaceTimed in with uh, Phelps uh, on our training camp. So that was pretty awesome. He gave us some good pointers about what to expect, uh, what the warm down and warm up pool is going to look like, how hectic it's all going to be. So just kind of be mentally prepared for all that. So I had an idea going into it. I just didn't really uh, have experience with it. So, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, uh, that seems like it would be pretty helpful. W- once you got there, did that, did it live up to your expectations? W- were there things you were like, Oh, I, I, it, w- were there things that surprised you at all? Um, I would say like the biggest thing that surprised me was how nice the facilities were in Tokyo. Like they really went up and beyond what everyone had kind of expected, you know? Um, so it was really awesome to see that, um, and the warm-up warm-down pool wasn't too bad um they had you know a training pool out like in a separate building right next to the actual competition pool so the actual warm-up warm-down pool wasn't too bad like there was obviously some busy days and stuff but all in all it was fine so i could manage you know warm-ups and stuff um but nothing really surprised me except for how much you walked i didn't i wasn't like fully mentally prepared for how many miles in the day you'd actually walk throughout the village, getting to the buses, um, that kind of stuff. Cause our, our bus to get to our venue is like at the end of the line for all the buses. So it was a little bit of a walk just on a daily basis, but you know, after the first couple of days, I kind of got used to it. How, do you know how far it was? Like, were you walking a mile each way longer uh, than that? No, it, it wasn't too much. It was just like, it added up throughout the day so it was like you know quarter mile walk to the bus is um you know you're walking throughout the venue then you walk back to the bus do the bus ride walk back to the dining hall then you know you got to go to the dining hall several times a day um so it probably added up to a few miles of walking every day um so i just didn't fully put that in my head and these are the things you think about when you're on taper as a swimmer. Uh, <laughs> I, it's, I, I, I would think that most people aren't, I, I guess maybe now a lot of people count their steps, but I, I think normally, you know, most people aren't like, I don't know how many miles I got in today, but you know, I, I'm, I'm guessing if you're trying to perform at a hundred percent at the Olympic games, you're maybe a little more conscious of it naturally. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so, so you get to the games, how are you feeling coming off of training camp? Um, were you feeling pretty, pretty springy, pretty good in the water? Um, so I actually was training with, uh, Caleb and coach Troy. Um, I was in their trying to training group, um, really enjoyed working with them. I got some different insights, obviously working with, you know, one of the best swimmers in the world. <clears throat> and, uh, I would say just like in general, I didn't feel the best. Um, I was just like the classic sprinter, you know, one day I felt great. One day I felt God awful, you know, some days I felt okay, you know? Um, so I wasn't really worried about how I was feeling. Um, more just like kind of went with the flow, trusted whatever Troy was doing. Cause you know, he knows, he knows what he's doing. So, um, yeah, I just kind of played it by ear. Um, if I was super tired one day, you know, I'd say, Hey, Troy, need to chill today. And he'd be like, okay, let's do it. Or like if, you know, the practice wasn't necessarily what I wanted to do that day, um, from what I was used to, I would just say, Hey, let's maybe do like, you know, three rounds instead of five or something like that. You know, so there was a lot of like communication between coach Troy and I. And, um, so we, we worked pretty well together in that aspect. Nice. That's, that's pretty nice. Especially, um, who, who were, who was your immediate coach, like heading into trials and right before camp? Um, well, I was working with Kelly Kramer in, uh, Minnesota Mm -hmm. pretty much the entire time that I went back to Minnesota, um, all the way up until trials. And then obviously that week break in between trials and leaving for training camp. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's nice to have, to go from, from Kelly, who, who obviously knows you very well as an athlete to Greg, who, who obviously knows athletes very well. And him and Kelly are like really good friends. So they, they talk a bit about it. So yeah, no, it worked out really well. Oh, nice. Even, even better. Uh, so then, you know, day, I guess it was day two at night that that was your first swim in prelims can you take me through that prelim swim and you know kind of did it feel like like any other prelim swim would or, or was there a palpable difference for you um well at trials like i have to go back to trials because like at trials every time i swam the 100 free or the 50 free i swam it a little better each time right so i was like picking new things that i could could do better or you know something that i messed up that i can fix um so going into the olympics for the heats at least um i knew exactly what i needed to do to go fast it was just a matter of how good do you feel in that 47 seconds in that you know hour of the day that day so um i i knew it all come together it just uh, it was a matter of like i wasn't worried about time i was just worried about you know keeping the lead or getting the lead whatever that ended up needing to be happening at that moment. So that was kind of my thought process going in, just um, doing my part in that relay to help them get into finals. Yeah. Uh, After prelims, uh, my first question has to be just like, were you able to go to sleep? Was it hard to go to sleep after having that first Olympic race? And it's like, you probably get home at like 10 or 11 PM. Yeah, the emotions were definitely high. Like, I, I took I take caffeine before I swim. Like, I take some pre workout, so I was very caffeinated. And you know, you're taking that at like you know 7:30 p.m. So <laughs> you get back at like 11 to um, the village, and yes, it was very difficult to sleep. I tried to try to take some melatonin and get back to bed. Um, so I probably got like six hours of sleep. So it's not too bad um enough to where you can call it a sleep um instead of just like a nap quick nap so i mean that wasn't too bad um i've had worse turnarounds uh, <laughs> and or stuff like that yeah yeah that 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 does that does sound pretty good considering you were caffeinated and you get back at 11 uh so then that final swim were you doing anything specific to, to wake yourself up, to wake your body up physically, to get ready for the morning finals? Um, yeah, I just, I woke up that morning. Um, 
around like 7.45. Um, just kind of did my normal routine, um, which is like a hot shower, just kind of waking yourself up, warming the body up. Um, I don't like to eat too much, so I didn't, I didn't eat, uh, I didn't eat a, like a big meal or anything. I have just like a cliff bar. Make sure I have something in my belly, make sure I have some fuel, uh, but nothing too crazy, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and so when did you find out that you would be on the, on the finals relay? Was that that morning or is that later that night? Uh, later that night, uh, Troy came out to me and said, you know, awesome swim. He's super proud of it. Um, just get ready for tomorrow morning. Cause it was kind of known that only one guy wouldn't swim for the replacement of Caleb. Um, and with me being the second fastest on the relay, I kind of knew I secured my spot to be there and to deserve to be there, you know? Yeah. So that, that was kind of the thought process. I wasn't too worried about it going into the heats. All I knew is I needed to go fast, do my part. Um, again, nothing was, I wasn't like, all right, I need to go 47, two or better to help out and get, get my spot. Blah, blah, blah. No, I, I didn't care. All I needed to do was just do my swim, whatever it took, doesn't matter the time, you know? So that was kind of the thought process. Yeah. Was it, I mean, was that pretty exciting when you saw your splits, you realized you were second and it's like, dude, I, I, I'm going to get to swim it again. Uh, I didn't know my split until, um, probably like 30 minutes after the race. Um, I just like went straight down to the warm down pool. Like I could, my legs were like fried. I could barely get out of the pool. So like, I knew I just needed to get over to that warm down pool. Uh, so I spent like 30 minutes in the warm down pool trying to get all the stuff out. Um, so I didn't even know until 30 minutes after. And then they're like, all right, you're swimming tomorrow. Get on the table, do whatever you need to do. Here's some food, uh, take a, you know, some, get some protein in you, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, all right, sweet. But like the overall feeling, I, I was just, I had my game face on. Like I, I knew what I needed to do to recover. I knew what I needed to do to get ready for the next morning, even though I was extremely caffeinated. So that's what I was really focusing on. I wasn't really worried about like, or thinking about like anything that I had done or what I need to do, just like focusing on the, the now, you know, what I need to do in that moment. And this is why you're on the Olympic team and I'm not, I would have been, <laughs> I just, I, I would have been so stoked. Um, but, but again, yeah, you're moving like a true professional. You do what you need to do that night. Next day, uh, you, you, you wake up, you go through your routine. Um, and then was it, was it a pretty similar mindset of just, all right, I gotta, I gotta do this. I mean, I, I'm guessing, you know, you could feel the tension. It's the four by one final at the Olympic games. I mean, I'm sure you're aware of the history that the U S and other teams have in this event. Um, how, how are you feeling headed, headed into it? I mean, obviously you're nervous. Like every guy in that ready room was like eyeing each other down, but like you could tell every single person in the room was pretty much nervous in their own way. You know, whatever that may be, everyone's kind of quiet. Everyone's kind of zoned in. Um, but like at the end of the day, it's, it's what we have done for years. You know, what do you do on a daily basis? Like it's, it's what you're, it's the same race you've been swimming and there's nothing different about it except the venue change and there's a bunch of cameras in your face. Right. So like, um, that's kind of what I was thinking in my mind. Like I've done this, done this race plenty of times. I know exactly what I need to do. Um, I swam it literally like 12 hours ago. Like, um, so I just need to do the same thing. Maybe if not a little better, if I can just let the, let the adrenaline in the moment take me. Yeah. Uh, do you, do you remember anything from your swim in particular? Um, I remember when Caleb dove in to start us off, I was like, Oh God, here we go. <laughs> you know, like that's when it like really set in and I was just trying to like, you know, stay ready, bounce around, you know, do whatever I needed to do. Um, but, uh, I was, I was just making sure that I did not fall start. That's exactly what I did not want to do off Blake. We had done plenty of uh, practicing with our exchanges. So I knew what I needed to do. It was just like, you know, second guessing yourself. But 
once I got in the water, it just was like, you know, instinct, adrenaline, just go. Um, so I, I went out a little too fast, but it ended up working out. Uh, I used the adrenaline to my advantage and just, you know, finished the best I possibly could. Um, but I would say the most, the biggest thing that I remember is just uh, seeing both those guys to my right and left right on me um, and just trying to drive into the wall, finish for Zach. So that, cause I knew if I could give Zach any sort of lead, the guy's a beast, like he's going to finish. Um, like he almost negative splits the freaking hundred. You're just like, all right, I see how it is. <laughs> um, so yeah, I knew if I could give him some open water, it's, it's, it's a good chance we, we can win. Right. So that was just the whole thought process in the water for me. Um, and then I just wanted to get out, uh, cause they couldn't, you couldn't get out in the lane. You had to go over to the side, you know? So I'm like trying to get over the lanes as fast as I can. I'm like seeing tunnel vision. I'm like, Oh my God, I gotta get out. So finally I get out, walk over and it's like the last 20 meters of the race and Zach's, you know, full body like the head. I'm like, Oh my God, we're going to win this thing. So I would say that's like the biggest thing that I remember. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then uh, you know, once Zach hits the wall, can you take me through the, the emotions that, you know, what did you realize or, or what went through your head first? Is it like, I'm an Olympic gold medalist. We just won. That was cool. Oh my God. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, honestly, I thought about like the fact that, you know, nine to 10 months ago before this, I wasn't even, I was pretty much retired. And now I'm an Olympic gold medalist. Like that's what I was thinking about. And just like the pure joy and like being able to sell. That's what's so great about relays. Like, yeah, it's awesome to win an individual gold medal. Like that's so cool. But like being with your teammates who like you raced through college and like at all these different pro series meets or an ISL, they're not your teammates and you get to celebrate that with them. Like all of your hard work, everything that you've like, just you just dropped your life for this you know it's just all that coming together in one moment is just insane like there's no words for it like other than just obviously you saw the video you can see our celebrations it pretty much says it all like you just you just get lost in the moment to where it's just pure excitement pure joy pure happiness you know all those different emotions yeah i i can imagine um it did <laughs> I think that's, you said it great. Uh, so then having, having the rest of the week off, um, well, like, were you off Were were the coaches saying like, Hey, you know, be ready. Or was it just like, no, you're done. Uh, yeah. Um, so pretty much I had to kind of do everything I needed to do. Came, came, went and warmed down after bunches of, uh, uh, media stuff and, uh, Troy came out to me after I was done with, with warm down. He said, Hey, you make sure you stay in the water and don't do anything crazy. Um, uh, just be ready to go. Uh, we might use you in something else. We don't know yet. So I said, okay, no problem. Um, so at that moment I knew like I could enjoy the moment. Right. But I wanted to stay focused and be ready to go if they ever needed me for anything. Um, I ended up not being on the four by one medley. Um, but you know, that was okay. At the end of the day, gold medalist Olympian, I did way more than anyone thought I could do. So I was, I was pretty happy with it. And like, it just lit a fire in my belly, ready to go. I don't know. Yeah. I, I, I don't, I don't see how it couldn't. That's, that's pretty, pretty inspiring. It seems pretty great. Did throughout the rest of the week, were you able to kind of sit with that process it, you know, did it, did it feel different on different days? And, and um, I mean, maybe not because you were so, you know, I'm guessing you were busy being a fan too and, and watching celebrating everyone else's swims. Yeah. That was the one thing that I really tried to focus on is just being there for every, uh, every single uh, heats and finals while I was out of the water. Uh, just cheering on everyone because like obviously there's no fans so you got to keep that energy really high Um, because a lot of the swimmers on our team thrive off that energy like I like me Um, so I just wanted to return the favor you know like um, I appreciated everyone 
uh, cheering for my race. So I wanted to return the favor in the same fact. Yeah, absolutely. Was was there was there a race that stood out to you that you got to watch throughout the week? Um, definitely Bobby Fink's mile. That was just an absolute killer performance. Like we knew he was going to close really hard. And like, cause from the 800, we're just like, we're ready for it. You know, we're cheering him on. He's just holding on with everyone else. And we're just waiting for that last 50. We're like, Holy, Holy crap. Here he goes. Here he goes. Here he goes. All right. That's ridiculous. And he went like 25, <laughs> seven, like I closed out my hundred and like the 25 low, like he's finishing the mile at a 25, seven. Like we were just all like, what <laughs> like just yeah no everyone was just losing it it was so fun i but i any relay is fun to watch that that also so all the relays are always just a blast to watch and cheer for yeah i i i definitely get that i mean and all the relays were i mean the they, they were all so exciting <laughs> especially for the u.s who that did really well and then I, I just I just got off with Bobby and we totally talked about that 25 <laughs> seven. It's like that's uh yeah, that was a great race. That was really fun to watch. Um so yeah, so it, you you alluded to it earlier, but let's get into that. You nine to ten months ago, you were essentially retired. <laughs> um what what how did you get into that position? Um, was, was that pretty much just everything shut down and you were like, well, what do I do? Yeah. So, so it has to start with the ISL. I was, um, getting ready for 2020 trials. Right. And, uh, my GM at the time, Jason Lezak called me and asked like, do you want to do ISL for season two? I said, I don't know yet. Cause I didn't know if I wanted to stop after 2020, no matter what. Right. So I said, I don't know if I want to be in ISL. Like, can I, can I get back to you on it after trials? Because if I make the team, I'm probably going to keep going or at least get somewhat of a decent time. Cause I wasn't even on national team. I had no sense of funding whatsoever, except for ISL. Um, so, and like part-time jobs. So um, once COVID hit, um, Jason lost a bunch of re, uh, roster spots. And I was one of the people who lost his roster roster spot. So once COVID hit, shut down everything, I just went home because there was nothing for me uh, other than training in Auburn because I was in Auburn at the time. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I went home, ended up just moving all my stuff back because I didn't really know what else to do. Um, I couldn't swim because I didn't have the funding necessary to do it or the promise of funding coming in the future, right? And I can't, maybe some people can, but I've never heard of anyone holding a full-time job and making the Olympics and doing what I wanted to do. So my, my dream was pretty much crushed. So about six months into that break, I was, I was working at this place. It's like a coffee wine bar, just kind of as like a server, bartender, uh, bus boy slash kind of everything. Um, was this in Vegas? Reno. My parents live in okay, Reno. Gotcha. So, uh, yeah, I was working there, living with my parents, just trying to make some money over the summer and all that. I didn't touch the water during those entire six months, like not once. I was just kind of mentally done with it, physically done with it. And just like, you know, kind of at first I was in kind of a bad spot, you know, because, uh, you know, just having things end that way obviously sucks. Yeah. Uh, and Jason Lisa called me out of nowhere and said, hey, I, I uh, I might have a, an open spot for you if you've been in the water and stuff. And I like, okay. He's like, how long have you been out? I was like, oh, you know, like two months. And he's like, okay. Yeah. Like you think you can get, start getting in the water now and like start getting back into shape. This is like five weeks before ISL starts. Mm-hmm. I was like, yeah. So I ended up getting in the water for that week. And then by the end of that week, um, Jason said that the Australians couldn't go because the Australian government weren't, weren't letting their swimmers right. out of the country. Um, so I was able to swim on the ISL team and that was my, my backing and my kickstart back into the sport. So I ended up going back to Minnesota literally right after that. Like, I think I packed up all my stuff into my car in like two days and then left. Um, 
and I ended up living with some buddies from college and, and just got straight to work. And uh, I got three weeks to train at Minnesota before I left for ISL. And oh, wow. okay. uh, obviously, as you can imagine, I did not do well. Uh, I put some beer weight on during my break. So that wasn't the best either. Um, so I got to swim in the ISL, got a little bit into, I got, I had okay times for, for taking six months off. Yeah. Um, and with only three weeks of training, but, uh, I was mostly benched for most of the ISL and, uh, I just used it kind of as like a training, training camp, um, learning from the other athletes. Um, John T. Skinner was our head coach at the time. Um, and he was just, John T. Yeah. <laughs> He was uh, just giving me tips, trying to rebuild my stroke, trying to get that feel, that natural feel back. So I just kind of used that as that. But yeah, I mean, that's kind of the story. I used ISL to get back into it. And uh, and then once I got back from ISL, I just got back here in, in Minneapolis and just started grinding. Just really put my head down and started working. So I knew yeah. I had a lot to catch up on. Yeah. Was, was there... It, it through that ISL process, was there a point where you, where you doubted that at all? Where, you know, when Jason first called, was it immediate? Like, yeah, I want to do this. Or were you like, I mean, I can't <laughs> like I've been at, you know, was, was that doubt or was that like, you were just like, yeah, of course I'm going to do this. My initial reaction was, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, I want to do this. But at, after the call, I'm like, eh, do I actually want to do this? It might be bad. So I, I didn't, I've never taken a six month break. I took a two month break after my senior year NCAAs and that was a lot. I was like really out of shape. You know, it took me a while to get back into shape for 2019 nationals. And, uh, so I called Kelly, asked him like, is, is this possible? Can I do this? Like, do you think it, I can even try? Like, is it worth my time? He said, absolutely. Absolutely. We can do it. I believe in you hundred percent. Um, I know Kelly and he, he, I know he wanted me to keep swimming. So I was kind of like, eh, do it. Right. <laughs> so I called Ron and Ron is a brutally honest with me. Uh, if you've ever, if people have ever heard our conversations, it's hilarious. But um, I was like, do you think I can do this? He's like, well, it's going to hurt like hell, but I think you can. Uh, you're just going to have to put, put in a lot of work for those first like six months. I said, okay. And uh, that was enough for me to just kind of be like, you know, if they believe in me, I think I, I think I can do it. That's that's it's nice to have people in your corner, and it nice to have people believing in you. That that's really cool to hear. I was Ron is one of the best podcasts I've ever done. I mean, he was the the way he thinks about things, the way and and how honest he is, um, and how candid he is. It was it's pretty amazing. So I can imagine your conversations are pretty entertaining. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, considering I'm like the only sprinter that's ever been <laughs> in the program so far. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's an interesting relationship for sure. Have, have you, since high school, have you ever gone back to, and trained with Ron? Absolutely not. <laughs> uh, I, I am done with the eight, eight to 10 K practices. They are not happening anymore. <laughs> totally understand that yeah that, that makes sense so so you you get back and then again in the budapest bubble you know your times are okay you don't get to race a ton but you kind of use it as a as a as a kickstart to get back into shape um was that you know did, did you have doubt then where was that process like you were pretty you were kind of in that environment and it's like okay i'm, I'm here I, i'm totally bought in like i think this is going well I mean, it's like any other time you're practicing, like obviously you have days where you're really tired and you can't do anything. And then I had somewhat good days where I was like doing almost the same times on a 25 meter like sprint as like some of the other guys, you know? So like, it was pretty promising to me at the same time um, that I could do this. You know, I had to, still had kind of a natural feel. I just needed to kind of rebuild it. Um, but once I like, was nearing the end of the camp. I was, I had my stroke pretty much together. It was just like, keep practicing it. And so I had a bunch of drills that Jonty showed me that I brought back to Minnesota with me um, and just kept on doing those throughout just because I knew that they would help me because I started feeling 
exponentially better through those five weeks or six weeks, obviously. Yeah. John T, one of my other favorite podcasts ever. He, one of my favorite guys to talk to ever. He's just a wizard. <laughs> he is. Uh, yeah. So that's, that just warms my heart that, that, uh, that he was able to help refacilitate that for you. So then you get back. Um, do you, did you guys make a plan? Cause again, you know, I know you said Ron mentioned, well, it's going to be a tough first six months, but it's like, again, how do you, you know, after taking six months off, how do you get ready for an Olympic trials with, did you have like eight or nine months at that point? Uh, so I got back right before, like a week before Thanksgiving, no, like a week and a half before Thanksgiving. So that was like mid November. Okay. okay. Um, so I had what? seven months seven and a half that sounds right yeah Yeah. so pretty much the goal was just um train full time um do whatever i needed to do um it it was the first three months i was back you know i i was struggling but i was having really good workouts they weren't what i used to be doing but in, in just the fact that I took that time off and I was back already doing that type of work with the, with Minnesota, I was really having really good workouts for myself. So I, I, I knew I could do it. It was just a matter of like staying fresh and like keep on coming back with that 110% every practice kind of mentality. Right. And, uh, that's a big thing that I kind of learned throughout my years is trial and error. Um, on what makes me, what's, what's too much, what's too little, um, where I need to be on a daily basis. And so Kelly had a lot of trust in me throughout the years of coaching me and watching me swim that he knew when I was tired and looked tired. And like, if I told him that I was tired, like he should listen. So like, you know, I'd have mornings where I'd wake up and I'd be like, no. And I'd call Kelly and just be like, I'm not coming in today. I'm, I'm dead. Like, this isn't, this isn't going to be good. He's like, okay, the next afternoon or the next morning, come in and just absolutely murder the practice and have like, you know, one of the best workouts I've had like in the past couple of weeks. Right. So it was just like learning where I needed to step it up a notch or bring it down a notch. And that helped me because my mindset is all these guys are up here. Right. And I'm kind of down here. So if they're putting in like, you know, they have a few practices where they're putting in 70, 60%, and I'm putting 110% every practice, I'm slowly going to work my way up. I can't afford to put in 60% in a practice, right? Mm-hmm. I can't afford to waste my time like that because I don't have the time that they, the, the time that they do. It's a really interesting philosophy. Uh, I've, I like it a lot. That's, uh, and obviously it worked, you know, you, you kind of found a system that worked for you was there. I mean, again, once those first three months, especially was there like an aerobic phase, did you have like the whole, you know, training blocks planned out or, or were you just kind of doing speed work the whole time and trying to get that feel and that power back? So through, through ISL, it was a lot of speed work, a lot of, uh, different stuff, not as much aerobic. When I got back to Minnesota, it was mostly aerobic type work, um, really working on trying to build that, that aerobic, um, base back Mm -hmm. so that when I got to about, uh, it was probably like February, March, that's when I really started to work on starting to develop that speed more. Um, we started doing a lot more power workouts, um, a lot more like stand up sets, um, but for a while there, for like several months, it was just aerobic after aerobic after aerobic with like, you know, obviously some fast stuff in there because you can't take days off of sprinting or else you just feel so bad. <laughs> but I mean, it was mostly for the most part aerobic trying to build that base back so that I have once I have that base, I can actually do something with it when I get some speed. Yeah. And so uh when did you start competing again um i think my first meet was in january yeah i think it was january um 
I did like two tier pro series throughout my time, two or three, I can't remember. And then one in uh, Florida with, with Ron, cause he would, you know, he, he'd fly me out, cover, cover the expenses. So I went to that Florida meet with uh, Cody and Blake um, and just kind of raced out there. Cause it was short course yards in the morning and then long course meters for finals. So that was kind of a cool little meet uh, to do. So I was able to get some racing in uh, the hardest part was, once I got to trials, I had no idea what I could go rested and shaved because the last time I had done that was uh, 2019 nationals, you know? So like I had absolutely no clue what I was doing or what I could do. Uh, what were you at nationals? Do you remember in, in 2019? Uh, in the 50, I think I was 22 double O. I tied for second with uh, Robert Howard. Okay. Um, so, I mean, that was decent. And then I went 49.0 or 49 flat. Um, but then I time trialed it and I went a 48, like nine or 48.8 because I knew I could okay. break 49. Okay. But, yeah. Uh, and th- so com- com- competition wise, um, how did you feel like you were progressing as you went from meet to meet? Um, I was starting to learn more, you know, like you start to understand where you're at, um, how much pain it actually is going to be in the real race, you know? Um, and in reality, like it's not something I haven't done before. Like I've raced long course all through college and, you know, we did long course with Ron a lot, you know? So like I knew what I was doing with long course. It was just a matter of like getting that feel back, knowing where, to start adding the legs or, or where in the race, I'm really going to have to put my head down to finish. Um, just little things like that, that you could nitpick. Cause I knew when I rested and shaved, everything would come together. It was just a matter of like getting those details in the feel of where I am in that race. Um, right. Yeah. It, I, it's, that's interesting that you were so confident that you knew everything would come together once you were rested and shaved and tapered. Just, I mean, that's great. Obviously as an athlete, that's what you want, but just having not done it for a while, what do you think gave you that confidence? Uh, just, uh, my coach, my coaches, um, working with Kelly, you know, he has utmost confidence in me the fact that he allowed me to come back after all that time and swim with the team during COVID um, just, just says a lot. And uh, my parents, obviously, and, and Ron, he's like, you know, to your pro series meets because, you know, the coaches can't leave for college. So I had Ron there. Um, He was like, dude, you're looking good. You're looking good. You know, you just got to keep going, work on this, work on that, you know, and just, yeah, just keep on working. So like I, I had those, you have a good support system allowing you to feel that way. Like if it was just me, I would be doubting myself the whole way. Like, Oh, I don't feel too good this way. I don't feel good that way. Oh, this, you know, this didn't go my way. But in reality, you just, you fill yourself with a good support system. I had good people I trained with. I had Max McHugh, even though he's a breaststroker kid, the kid destroys aerobic workouts. So like, he's an awesome, uh, aerobic swimming partner, just any other set other than like, you know, primary work. He's great. So I always had him had some good sprinters at Minnesota, um, to kind of always be right there, you know? So, um, I always had that, um, I would say, but obviously I never knew that like, I never knew I was going to make the team and be an Olympic gold medalist. Like I had no idea, but that was definitely the goal from the start. Like I told my mom and dad, I was like, if I do this, like I'm not doing it just to swim. I'm, I'm doing it to go all the freaking way. Like that was the goal from the start. Like there was no um, messing around for me if I was going to come back. Yeah. Was it- was that an easy decision for you to make? Uh, I, I, I spent a few, like, cause I had a full week to think about it. I was back in the water, right. And Reno, 
just swimming a couple grand by myself. So it gives you a lot of time to think about like, do you, do I really want to do something like this? It gives you a lot of time to yourself. Like, and, and by, by the end of like the fifth day of really thinking everything over, I was like, you know what? I, I think I can do it. And I, I want to do it. Like, this would be awesome. And like you, I don't want to come back and have regrets that I didn't try. So like, that was me saying, you know, I'm going to give it everything I got and whatever happens happens, but at least I can say I tried and I was this close or, you know, I tried and I made it. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that totally. <laughs> I, I personally, I'm glad you did uh, because we get to sit here and, and talk about it now. So you, you get to trials, you, you're rested, you're shaved. Um, can you tell me about that first prelims hundred? And uh, you you go forty eight sixty one. Your your eighth. Uh, how did that swim feel? Uh, it. I just remember it hurting a bit more than I thought it would, but at the same time, um, I knew I wasn't out fast enough, and also I was just a little slow into the turn. Um, just a few things like slow off the blocks. So just a few things that I could nitpick and like where I needed to like add my legs. So like I knew for prelims, I, my legs were a little bit too much involved, but not going fast enough, if that makes sense. So I, I was really f more forcing it instead of having that easy speed, um, which in a hundred, you really need to have that easy speed if you're going to be able to finish unless you're Zach Apple, but <laughs> no, but like, um, so that was really the focus was just making sure I could have that easy speed going into semifinals, being able to have my legs on the way home. Yeah. Uh, it's so once you finish eighth and you go 48, six, how do you process that in terms of, okay, like I've got a night swim, I mean, again, do you just go into game face mode or was that kind of like, holy, I like the, it's like game on. I would say it's, it's game face. You put your game face on. Like for me, I don't look at it as a whole. You take it one race at a time because mm -hmm. if you look at it as a whole, you're going to kill yourself. You're going to destroy yourself. So um, definitely just tried to focus on one race at a time, one day at a time. Right. Uh, whatever it took to stay in that moment, whatever I needed to be doing, just like I did at Olympics, like stay in the now, whatever you got to be doing for that moment to get ready for the next race, whatever that may be. So that was really what I was trying to focus on. Um, so, yeah, no, no, go ahead. So then how did you, you know, after, after that 48, six prelim, how do you get ready for semis? Um, I just made sure I fully worn down. It takes me like a solid like half hour, um, got a massage and then just, you know, hydrate, eat whatever you need to, to feel good. And then, uh, just get ready for the night swim, I guess, you know, chat with a bunch of coaches, see what they picked. Cause I love picking the brains of different coaches. They all have something different to offer. Maybe it might be the same. They might just reword it to where you can actually understand it or like understand it better in your own terms. Right. So I like chatting with a whole bunch of different coaches um, about what they, what they see or what they think needs to be changed. And then it's up to me whether I think that's actually correct, right? But a lot of times they are. Um, just a matter of like how they word it. Yeah. So, so then in semis, you go 48-6 again. You're tied for sixth heading into that final. Heading into the final, how are you feeling? Well, I was, I was tied for six. I knew that. And I know everyone in that freaking final, that final is a beast, right? Like everyone is there because they work hard. So um, really my thought process is just like, I know what I need to do. I think my, my whole plan was just, you know, out touch two people. That's really what it came down to. All I need to do is not be one of those guys that gets out touch. Cause like I knew what that felt like. Cause I uh, got out touched by Dean Ferris in 2019 NCAAs. Uh, he beat me by three one hundreds, I think. 
Yeah. And as much as going 40.83 short course yards was really cool, I wanted to win, right? <laughs> so that, that was hard for me. So I knew whatever it came down to, like just whatever it took to not be out touched by those two guys, you know, I'd have to do. So that was kind of my thought process is like, that's happened to me before. Not again. Let's just send it, you know, just absolutely send it and see what happens. What, what, again, what was the immediate reaction of finishing that race? Did you see your time? Did you see your place? Uh, what, what, what were the immediate emotions for you? Um, I tried to control it cause I saw the fifth and I was, mm. I was a little upset cause you, it's nice to have that guarantee. Like, yeah. yes, I made it. Yeah. Um, so I was, I was a little upset, especially cause there was only six 100s separating me from third, like Blake, you know, was six 100s and then Brooks was three, three 100s behind Blake. Mm-hmm. So like we were all really close together. So I was like, dang, you know, um, but at the same time, I was, I was very happy, very pleased. And, uh, I, I just, at that moment, like I, you know, co- hugged my coach, you know, it's like, you know, that should, that should make it like you have a good chance, but just let's focus on the 50. Let's, let's do what we need to do to, to fully recover from this, get a massage, whatever you need to do. So like, I still had that game plan going on in my mind so that I'm not worrying about it as much. Like, yeah, it's a good chance, but I don't want to like, be like, yeah, I made it like, woo woo. like, and, um, so I just put all my focus into the 50 the last day or the last two days, I should say. Yeah. So, so just obvious, obviously you make the team we've, we've been through your Olympic experience. Um, now you're back at home. Ha- have you been able to process to just sit with everything that's happened over the past couple of months? H- how are you feeling about it now? Uh, yeah, I mean, I went home and it's a Reno right after Tokyo, just visited family and, uh, some friends. So it was super nice, um, just to kind of see them. I hadn't seen them since Christmas. So, um, it's just nice to be home for a bit. And it definitely made me realize how big of a deal it was, especially coming home. And like, you know, you have little kids. We did like this meet and greet with all my parents, friends, family, uh, people who have heard of me, they could all come to, you know, the old place I worked and meet me. We did like this whole thing and a whole bunch of little kids and they all are like starry eyed when they see you. And it's just, it's awesome. Cause I remember seeing those Olympic gold medalists when I was young and being like, wow, Olympic gold medalists. I don't think they like fully know what that means, right. but at the same time they know it's a big deal. So like, it's just, it was really awesome to see that and to be able to like show them the gold and like, you know, take pictures with them, sign whatever they want. Like that, that's just cool to me. The fact that I can like be um, a role model for these little kids that just like love swimming. I'm like, do you like swimming? They're like, yeah. (laughs) So I'd say that was like the coolest part and the biggest, like, just like, wow moment for me. Yeah. That, I mean, that is super cool. And, great to hear about was did you have an olympian that who you ever got to meet or get their autograph or that you particularly looked up to when you were that age yeah for me i met jason lezak when i was like i think i was like 13 um he came and talked at our sam pecker banquet um brought his like gold medal and i didn't realize at the time how big of a deal jason lezak talking to us was Um, until, you know, probably two or three years later, but just the fact that I got to see him in that moment and then look back and be like, damn, I met Jason Lezak. What a, he's such a cool dude. (laughs) Like he's this legend, you know? And, uh, yeah, I would say he, he was always like kind of my idol, uh, just cause you know, I like the hundred freestyle and, uh, I like swimming relays and he was the guy for that. So. He was, he was the relay guy and now you swim for him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I actually, I actually got drafted to the Tokyo Frog Kings, um, in the draft this past season. So I will not be with Jason, but I'm excited to swim for Tokyo this time around. Yeah. So I, yeah, I should have, now you, 
have swam for him. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I mean, just the fact that Jason Lezak was the one who gave me a chance to swim again, like that, that's awesome to me. And like, I, I thank him a lot for that. Cause like he believed in me when no one else did, you know? Yeah. So that was awesome. I mean, talk about full circle. That's, <laughs> that's pretty dang cool. Um, I, I, I was going to ask this at some point, it kept slipping my mind. So what, well, during your comeback after ISL, um, how, financially, how did, how did you make it? How did you get by? Um, I used ISL as like, kind of like my, my main source of income. And then I did a bunch of different stuff. So I was representing sandpipers at all the meets. Mm -hmm. So I got a little bit of a stipend for that. I uh, was co I coached men's high school uh, part time. I coached club part time, and then I also did a few fitter and faster clinics. Okay. Just to kind of all like I had like literally like technically four jobs at once, but they were all like part time, kind of when I needed to work on. Um, wouldn't stress me out too much. Um, so yeah, that was kind of how I, how I did things and it worked out pretty well. I mean, I was living paycheck to paycheck, but at the same time, it was enough to live comfortably, get whatever food I needed, um, and just get by pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it that, that's really great that you were able to make it work and yeah, kind of piece all those little things together. Um, so, so now You've got ISL with the Tokyo Frog Kings coming up in a couple weeks. Um, just how, how are you feeling about moving forward and kind of already jumping to that next chapter after such a big one? Um, I'm excited, like more excited than I've been in a long time. Um, I was excited to go back to work after I won Big Tens my junior year going into my senior year. So like I'm, I'm excited for that. Um, excited because we have some new coaches at Minnesota. I think they're great coaches. Um, so I'm excited to be able to work with them eventually once I get back. Um, and also the fact that I can finally lift at Minnesota, that's, that's pretty exciting because of COVID they didn't allow uh, pros to lift there for a while. So I was lifting by myself. So that was really hard. You know, all these things that like I had to deal with last year, I don't have to deal with anymore. I got a whole bunch of new things to look forward to. And at the end of the day, I'm just ready to like keep adding on to what I have. I don't want to lose everything that I've worked for so far because that was, that was hell to get it back. Right. <laughs> don't want to do that again. But at the same time, um, just, I, I want to know what I can do. Like, I know I can get better because there's so many things that I like kind of weren't the best at, in my opinion, for my racing. Um, and just the fact that I only had nine months to do it. So like, imagine if I can add a few more years to that and actually not lose it this time and just keep that mindset correct how I had it these past nine months. Like, I, I just think I have a lot more available. That's to say if I can stay healthy um, just because of my uh, rheumatoid. So I want to I wanna make sure that my rheumatoid is like, um, okay during those three years, these next three years, because that's always been a problem for me. Yeah. Is that, um, is that something that you, you pretty much have to constantly manage? Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a daily basis type of thing. Like, uh, you know, uh, whether it's okay, you know, let's not do more than 2000 meters or yards of kicking, or let's not do like full squats in the weight room or, just, just simple things like that. Plenty of trial and errors for me to where, you know, I failed, my knees have sw swelled up. Okay. Let's not do that. Okay. Uh, this one, this part works. And then I tried this and it, you know, made my knees swell up. So like, um, I kind of know my body now from messing it up so many times to where I can kind of handle it a little better. Um, it's just a matter of, you know, having good doc, having a good doc here, um, taking the right medications, um, just trying to find a balance pretty much. Yeah. Uh, just, just to clear it up, that's rheumatoid arthritis, correct? Yes. And yes. what is that? So a lot of people 
uh, think it's just like osteoarthritis. They think like, you know, old people get it, like, you know, your cartilage kind of degrades. Rheumatoid is different. I was born with it. Um, I didn't find out I had it until 11 years old, but you can get it when you're born. You can get it when you're born. Right. And, uh, it pretty much is just my immune system, uh, attacks its, uh, attacks my body for literally no reason. It overreacts to anything. So like, say I'm running and my knees are doing this or like my joints are kind of smashing together. They think like they're, it's getting attacked. So they'll send my immune system to go fix it, even though there's nothing there to fix. So my immune system ends up just attacking itself. Um, so there's, there's medications to, to handle it and uh, deal with it a little bit better, um, like immunosuppressant drugs and stuff. Cause at the end of the day, it's your immune system overreacting. So if you calm your immune system down, uh, it helps. Was, was that something you had a, uh, I mean, obviously you mentioned it was a day-to-day thing was uh, during this lead up to, to trials and to, and to the games during your comeback, were, were there any serious, like flare-ups or moments where you had to really drop everything and deal with that yeah like i think it was uh march march uh yeah it was like beginning of march uh, my knee swelled up again um so i didn't want to deal with it i i was just like screw it i just went and got it drained they drain out all the fluid and then just give you a, a cortisone injection um I dealt with that and uh, my knee was fine throughout uh, trials and Olympics from that. I just try really hard not to get cortisones very often because they're very, they're not good for you. Right. So, yeah. um, But it's also not good to have all this fluid in your knees. So, um, but yeah, that's, that's always been a problem for me. Like people always said like, Oh, Bo's a short course yard swimmer, but not a long course meter swimmer. I'm, in my opinion, I think I'm a better long course meter swimmer than short course yards because my, my turns and like my underwaters are atrocious. They're non-existent. Right? So like, um, I feel like I can out swim a lot of these guys out here uh, that I'm racing against. It's just a matter of like staying healthy. So like for the college seasons, I did what I needed to. Um, and sometimes they'd be swollen. Sometimes I could get them under control. Um, and then for the summer months, I don't know why, but like every summer, my knees would just swell up and like, I couldn't kick, I couldn't lift. I literally pulled a lot of practices or whatever I needed to do to make sure that they didn't flip out. Right. And so I never had like a good long course meet after my, after 2016 trials for a long time. So people always just automatically thought like, yeah, you just can't swim long course. It just, it just doesn't. Trans- translate i'm like oh no I don't think so. but you know like i just hadn't shown i just hadn't shown anyone that what i could do you know so uh it was just a matter of staying healthy and trying to trying to prove people that i am a long course meter swimmer you know um but yeah seems like you did an okay job of that <laughs> uh so Sorry, just to clarify, is is your knee or knees specifically how how this um, how this condition manifests itself within your body and within your training? Yeah, good question. So uh, it actually showed up. I didn't even know I had it until I was eleven. I tore, I slightly tore my meniscus in a PE class when I was like in sixth grade, and had to get surgery to fix it. It was a minor surgery, right? Um, but my knee was super swollen after the surgery. They're like, we don't know. You're gonna have to get tested for rheumatoid. And my parents were like, what? That doesn't make any sense. So I ended up getting tested, found out I had it. And the rheumatologist at the time told me as an 11 year old, like, you can't run anymore. You can't go out and do this, this, the normal stuff of an 11 year old boy. All you can do is swim. You can swim. That's your way of like actually exercising. Otherwise you can have crazy issues. So obviously that's a lot to take in for an 11 year old. Um, no kidding. <laughs> but it, it was through middle school and high school, it was affecting, it can affect any joint, any joint at all, but it was affecting my ankles, my knees and my lower back. Um, 
once I got on the immunosuppressant um, drugs, it kind of went away for a little bit. And then it focused really on just my right knee throughout college. So I had just one spot to worry about usually. Um, so that's nice because it's, you know, somewhat better. It's not affecting all my joints. Now it's just affecting one. So that made it a little bit more helpful. Uh, but uh, yeah, it can, it can pretty much happen to any of my joints. But for the past six years, it's been my right knee. They, they don't know why and I don't know why, but yeah, very interesting. If, if you take immuno repressant medication is that am i saying that correctly uh yeah, i mean it, it's just like uh bio, biologics you can just say biologics okay yeah, were, were you prone to illness more when you took it yeah uh i mean it's exactly what it sounds like uh, suppresses your immune system so like um you know when i like to give you an example when i got my covid vaccine they're like, take it at your own discretion. Like you could be hospitalized from it. Mm. I was like, okay, I took it. I was fine. You know, I had a headache the first one. The second one I had like a night where I had night sweats, Mm -hmm. but other than that, I was fine. So I would say I'm pretty lucky. I know a lot of people get like super ill off of it. Sometimes like a a cold can turn into like flu like symptoms, Mm -hmm. but uh, no, I, I got pretty lucky in that aspect. So that's good. Um, but when I get like flus, I, I get put down for a while. Thank God I don't get them often, but yeah. Uh, I, now I'm just shocked at the collegiate career you were able to put up <laughs> uh, yeah. going through all of this. Yeah. Well, uh, for a long time, I didn't, I didn't share with people. I don't want people to feel bad for me and be like, oh, it's, you know, it's good job for doing what you did. You know, like, I don't want that pity. Like, um yeah yeah I, i've had my pity parties throughout the years and been like why me why um like if only i was like somewhat normal what what kind of times would i be putting up you know but in reality like it, it is what it is it it's what got me into the sport of swimming i would have never swam i would have never been an olympic gold medalist if it wasn't for this so like that's something that i always try to tell myself anytime i'm trying to deal with something like this um but yeah, I mean, it was quite a battle for a very long time. Still is. If if you're not exercising, does it subside more, no, or no, subside noticeably? Uh, no, it, it usually gets worse if I'm not exercising at all. Like I was, I was out. I, I was living the life during my six month off. I, <laughs> I literally went to to golf like three to four times a week. So that was kind of like my exercise. <laughs> I don't mean to offend golfers, but um, anyways, yeah. So like I was still out and about doing stuff. Um, I was working. So like I was still walking around, um, but swimming's healthy for it just because you're in water and it's, you know, pretty nice to your joints, but not at the level that I do it or like any other like professional athlete or D1 athlete, like the way you're pushing your body, it is not healthy in a, in a, in a sense, like, yes, it's great. You're working out, you're working out hard, but like not at that level, like, yeah, just a little too much for it to be like considered helpful. Yeah. That makes sense. (laughs) That, that, uh, that checks out. Um, wow. So quite the journey, but (laughs) you're, you're about to embark on this Italian journey for, uh, for season three of ISL with, with Tokyo. Do you know your teammates or coaches on Tokyo at all? Um, I don't know any of the Japanese swimmers, so that's going to be really cool to be able to chat with them and get to know them. Cause, um, I've heard they're awesome. Um, there's a few Russians on the team, so I'm curious to see how that will, will go. Like I've never really chatted with any Russians, so you know, maybe they're the nicest people ever. You just never know. Um, but at the same time, uh, I think I know Paige, Paige Madden, um, who is uh, Katie Deloof, And I, th- I think it's Mallory. Mallory Comerford is um, on Tokyo. I'm not entirely sure. I thought I read that. But anyways, I know a few people. So like, I, 
it's fine. Like we'll all be kind of in the same area doing the same stuff. So I'm sure we'll be able to hang out and do stuff, but. Yeah. Well, cool. Uh, I mean, Bo, I really appreciate you taking the time to sit down and, and chat. It's, it's been great to hear your story and get your perspective on the last few months, last few years, basically your whole life. Uh, it's, it's, it's been really nice. I, I appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Uh, any parting thoughts for our audience before we sign off today? Uh, I'll add one more thing. So like, I don't want to be like, I always tell people this, like, I don't want to be known as like the guy who has rheumatoid and made the Olympic team. Right. I share that only because I, I want to like, uh, inspire other people to just like do things that they wouldn't normally do. Like if something's holding you back, there's always a way around it. And like, that's why I like to share my story. It's just, there's a way to achieve your goals, even if there's something overhead that's really like hard to get past, but you can do it. It's just a matter of like how hard you're willing to work for it. So I just, I just want people to know that that's why I'm, I'm sharing this story. I don't want people to feel bad for me. I don't want people to like, be like, Oh, he's the dude with rheumatoid. No. Like that, that's not why I share this. Cause I, I didn't share with it, share with many people for a very long time. So, um, yeah, that's pretty much my parting gift. Anything's possible. Don't let anything stop you and just try your best, whatever that means. You've been listening to the swim swim podcast. Stay tuned for new episodes every week. You can take Swim Swim Podcast on the go by subscribing on your favorite podcast platform. Look for links in the description below and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos as well.